Hello, I'm Jeremy Zimmerman from Colorado School of Mines, and today I'm going to be discussing calculating distances in crystals. This video will teach you about crystallographic directions, crystallographic families, and how to calculate dot products, distances, and angles between arbitrary vectors and a non-orthonormal basis. You might be wondering why you would want to do this. First thing you could do is you could calculate the distance between two atoms if you were to know the crystal structure. This can tell you information about the type of bonds, uh, or perhaps the efficiency of energy transfer from one atom to another. In many cases, the distance an atom needs to move is an important quantity. Uh, two examples of this are in diffusion and dislocation movement. Finally, this is a basic skill for analyzing and understanding materials, and we will build on this idea in further chapters. Crystallographic directions are given by the letters u, v, w in square brackets. Uh, this is a vector in a crystal. Um, u, v, and w are always integers. If they are a fraction, when you calculate it, you have to multiply by the lowest common denominator to make them into integers. We represent negative numbers with a bar over the top. So u bar or bar u is equal to negative u. Again, it's important to use square brackets because we use different types of brackets to denote different quantities in a crystal. And these integers u, v, w are multipliers of the lattice translation vectors. Here I'm showing a vector in this crystal. So this is a crystallographic direction. And it goes from the origin of the unit cell back here to this front corner here. So this moves one in the a direction, two in the b direction, and one in the c direction. So this gets a crystallographic direction of one, two, one. In orange, I start at the origin and I go um, one in the a direction, one and a half in the b direction, and zero in the c direction. Since we went one and a half in the b direction, we have to multiply by two in order to get to the crystallographic direction two, three, zero. Finally, here in maroon, we're going from this front corner to the back corner. We go negative one in the a direction, two in the b direction, and zero in the c direction. So this gets um, noted as one bar to zero. Because crystals are often symmetric, there are often multiple directions in a crystal that are equivalent to each other. We call all of the equivalent directions a family. A family of directions is written as UVW in angle brackets, as I show here. If you're given a crystal structure or a, a unit cell and a direction, UVW, you want to know what other directions are equivalent to it. So how can you go about doing this? The real answer is that the crystallographic direction, UVW, must be repeated by the symmetry operations. Now we haven't covered this yet, so we'll come back to this later on in the class, but for now we'll talk about the maximum possible uh, multiplicity or the maximum possible number of directions in a family. The first thing I would do is I would look at the unit cell and I would think about what would happen if we exchanged the labeling of the axes. If the shape of the unit cell does not change when you exchange A and B, for example, you would be able to exchange U and V in the crystallographic direction, and it would still be a member of the family. Another thing you can think about is did the length of the vector change? If two directions are equivalent, the length of those two crystallographic directions will be the same. Finally, the cell must be identical when viewed along different members of a family of directions. For example, if you have two different types of atoms, let's just say A and B, and you're going in one direction, and you come across atom A and then B, then there's a little gap, and then you say A, B, and then a gap, A, B, and that continues on. If you were to turn around and go backwards in the opposite direction, you would see atoms coming at you that would look like B, A, then a gap, B, A, and then a gap, B, A, and a gap. 
In this case, these two directions are not equivalent. This would, will be much easier to figure out when you look at the symmetry of the system. For now, let's calculate the maximum multiplicity for, e for any crystal system. The way we do this is we calculate the number of allowed U, V, and W permutations. And then we'll multiply that by the number of sign combinations of those U, V, W values. When you do this, make sure that the length and atomic arrangement are unchanged, so you're not changing the unit cell when you do one of these permutations or sign flips. There will be somewhere between 1 and 48 equivalent directions per family. One direction in certain low symmetry triclinic systems and up to 48 in the highest symmetry cubic systems. For practice, let's list all of the members of the 110 family in a cubic system. I'm showing half of the equivalent directions in this diagram. Each of the face diagonals would be an equivalent direction, and I only showed half of them, and I say this because each of these directions could point in the opposite direction. So the red one could also point in this direction. So the first thing we'll do is we will create all the permutations of U, V, and W. And this is 110, 101, and 011. We then need to take all of the sign permutations of these, and those are given here. I would now like to talk about calculating distances in crystals. We're going to calculate the distance of an arbitrary direction in this two-dimensional crystal here. We will define the arbitrary direction as delta x, delta y, and delta z, where these are fraction, which is a fractional crystallographic vector, and each of these x, y, and z values are fractions of a, b, and c. Similarly, the position within a cell can be given by fractional coordinates of a, b, c. So these would just be x, y, and z times a, b, and c. And here we don't use any brackets when we write these down. If we want to calculate the distance between the origin and this point here, we are calculating the length of the vector r, as I have labeled it. This is really simple in Cartesian coordinates. The length of r is simply going to be given by the square root of x times a squared plus y b squared, where a and b are the magnitudes of the crystallographic directions a and b. Now what's going to happen when we work in a little bit nastier crystal system where the angle between our crystallographic directions a and b is not equal to 90 degrees? We could decompose a and b into Cartesian directions and figure it out from here, but this is really error prone and really cumbersome. Furthermore, this is fairly easy to do in two dimensions, but you probably don't know how angles interact in three dimensions, so you run into some real serious problems in a triclinic cell. Again, we're going to calculate the length of the vector r. We're going to decompose r into two vectors, x times a and y times b. And one way that you can calculate the length of r is to take the dot product of r with itself. So when I do this, r dot r is going to be xa plus yb dotted with xa plus yb. If we multiply this out, you'll get x squared a dot a plus xy a dot b plus yx b dot a plus y squared b dot b. Now, if you've done a lot of linear algebra, you may notice that this would be really easy to write down in matrix form. The equivalent equation is written down here. So r squared is going to be the vector xy multiplied by this tensor of a dot a, a dot b, b dot a, b dot b, multiplied by the vector xy again. This thing in the middle is called the metric tensor. The metric tensor is really important because it allows us to easily compute the dot product in a non-orthonormal basis. We can extend this metric tensor into three dimensions by simply adding an extra row and a column to our metric tensor and filling it up with the correct dot products. As we go across the top row, it's a dot a, a dot b, a dot c. Second row, you have a b in the first position of the dot product. You need to remember what the dot product is in each of these crystal systems. For example, a dot c is going to be the magnitude of a times the magnitude of c times the cosine of the angle between them, which is beta. So if you just go through all the permutations of all these different things, you can write down that the metric tensor will always look something like this. In general, 
where UVW is crystallographic direction or uh, the difference in fractional coordinates, delta x, delta y, and delta z, you can calculate the length of r squared as r dotted with itself, which is simply the vector uvw times the metric tensor times uvw again. It is really important to remember that this is simply a dot product. I have a few things I'd like you to consider. First, if you're not very comfortable using matrices, I want you to multiply out the last equation on slide 4 and see if you can get back to the equation on the line above it. Second, if you're given a set of two fractional coordinates in a crystal, x1, y1, and z1, and x2, y2, z2, what steps would be required to calculate the distance between them? Third, the angle between two vectors is given by r1 dot r2 is equal to the magnitude of r1 times the magnitude of r2 times the cosine of the angle between them. So how would you use the metric tensor to calculate the angle between r1 and r2? Finally, if you need some more practice at this, write out and simplify the metric tensor for each of the seven crystal systems. Finally, try calculating the length of the vector 1, 1 bar, 4 in a system where the unit cell is defined by A equals 0.4 nanometers, B is 1 nanometer, C is a half a nanometer, and the angles between the vectors are 90, 104.5, and 90. Thank you very much.